name is Rachel. And I'm Sarah. We are part of the Scripture Union Schools team here in Northern Ireland. And we're really excited to join with you today. In SU and I, we want to still bring SU groups together. We still want to open God's Word. We're really missing being with you guys in SU groups. We're really missing the opportunity to open God's Word and to pray with and for you. So every week we'll be releasing a video here live on Facebook and over on our Instagram at SU and I Info. There'll be challenges each week, a chance to open God's Word together and to respond afterwards. So every Wednesday at 3 p.m., look out for this video. The code you'll need today uh, for menti.com will be available in the comments below and at the end of this video. That's where we want to go uh, to, for you guys to respond to what you hear in God's Word. As I said, each week we'll be completing a challenge. This week is the whipped cream challenge. So if you have some at home, grab it or grab something similar like thick Greek yogurt or mousse and give it a go. Here's a video of how some of our staff and families got on this week. Have a go at home and tag us in your Insta videos at SENI Info or post it here on our Facebook pages. The winner will be announced in next week's video. We'd also love to just hear from you guys. How are you getting on? What are your SU groups doing to encourage one another and to stay connected? So DM us or, or comment below. We'd just love to hear from you. Right now, we are in times of isolation and of disconnect. And so on Wednesdays, we're going to be looking at the life of Paul. Because Paul faced isolation and disconnect. He faced long journeys, he faced imprisonment, and he faced separation from the early believers and from the local church. And so we believe that God has something to say to each one of us in this season of isolation and disconnect as well. Paul has an incredible story. God used Paul's one life uh, to transform him and to transform the lives of hundreds of people in the early church. He's still impacting lives today. And we believe that God wants to use our one life, your one life, to be transformed, to walk with others, to take risks and to fix our eyes on him. Before we get to the life of Paul, we need to understand the context of what was going on at the time. The church had just been born. Jesus had just given his followers the mission to go and teach everyone about salvation, about what Jesus had done for them through his death and his resurrection. And the Holy Spirit had just given them the power, the power to heal, the power to proclaim, the power to teach and the power to encourage. The church was multiplying. Just imagine what it would have been like to be a part of the church in those early days and see thousands of people come to faith daily. Like we get excited when one person comes to faith in Jesus, but think of the buzz, think of the excitement, think of the level of faith that people would have when you see thousands of people trusting in Jesus every day. But not everyone liked it. And that's where we meet Paul. Well, actually at this point, his name was Saul. And Saul didn't believe that Jesus was the savior and he didn't want anyone else to believe that Jesus was the saviour either. In fact, when we first meet Saul, he is approving of the stoning of Stephen, who is a follower of Jesus. Let's read together in Acts chapter 8. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Saul was a sworn enemy of Jesus and of his followers. He was destroying the church. In other versions, words like ravaged the church, persecuted, brought terrible suffering are the words that are used. 
Believers were beaten up, thrown in jail and killed for following Jesus. Saul was far from God. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord then told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Saul is probably one of the least likely people who we would ever expect to come and know Jesus. And yet what we find is from this one moment, walking along an everyday and ordinary road to Damascus, Saul encounters the Lord for the very first time and it transforms his life forever. And not only his life, but the hundreds of lives around him. We all have those people, don't we, in our lives, the people who are the least likely to ever come and to know Jesus. And what we tend to do sometimes is we tend to shell those people, the people who seem just too far from God, too far from his transforming power. We love writing down lists, don't we, of people to pray for, the people who are the least likely. And yet what we often do at times is we scrumple that up and we throw it away after a week or two because it's harder to believe sometimes in this transforming power of Jesus than actually to persevere in prayer and hope for them. But today we want to say through this story, we can see the absolute transforming power of Jesus in the life of somebody who was the least likely, the absolutely least likely person to ever know Jesus. It's in the everyday and the ordinary that God chooses to speak to Saul. Saul hasn't even reached Damascus yet. He hasn't even gotten to persecute hundreds and hundreds of Christians. There's no crowds around him. Nobody's near him. It's just Saul and his men. And it's on this road that he encounters God for the very first time. There's something that we can learn about this ordinary and everyday setting in which God chooses to speak. It's actually quite dramatic when we look at it. It says, suddenly a light flashed from heaven around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
It's in these everyday and ordinary moments that God chooses to do something incredible. Saul is walking along a road and God chooses to speak to him. And in this moment, Saul realizes three things. He realizes that God is real. He realizes that God can speak to him, but he also realizes that God will instruct him on the steps in which next to take. Sometimes it can feel like we're in a waiting room right now. We're waiting for the big worship event to happen before we can have a transformational moment with God. We're waiting for somebody much older and much wiser to be sharing from the front before we can have a transformational moment with God. Or maybe we're waiting for the big youth weekend away before we can have a transformational moment with God. And it's really important to remember that, yeah, God is in all of these things, but at a time whenever we're at home at the minute, God can still move. God is still at work. And actually, there's many, many transformational moments for each and every one of us today and tomorrow and in the weeks ahead. And so my question to you is, are you willing to be interrupted in your everyday life by God? Where do you think God is interrupting you in your life today? Take some time to answer this question. This transformative moment wasn't easy for Saul. God could have struck him down in this very moment, but even as Saul is breathing out his murderous threats against God's people, God still saw a hope and a plan revealed for Saul and for so many others. But God makes Saul blind. He does make him really uncomfortable. Close your eyes for a second. What's it like everything being dark around you? Can you hear anything more clearly? How do you feel? You can open your eyes again. I want you to imagine that you're standing on the road outside of your house. And with your eyes closed, you have to find your way to Belfast City Hall from where you're standing. How do you feel? It's not an easy journey God's asking Saul to take. Saul loses his sight and is left to go to Damascus and wait for Ananias. This transformative moment isn't over just yet. Saul is still living in literal darkness. So God sends Ananias, one of his most faithful followers, to go and to pray with Saul. No doubt Ananias thought God was absolutely crazy for sending him. He actually says to God, he says, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But God says, go. And so Ananias, in complete faith and trust and obedience, and complete belief in a God who can completely transform a life goes. And he goes and he prays with Saul and it says that he places his hands on Saul and he prays for complete healing. He also prays that Saul will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so it says like scales fall from Saul's eyes and he's able to see again. He goes out and he's baptized and he shares the life and the love of Jesus with anybody who will listen to him. I love this very starting block really in Saul's journey with Jesus. I love it because it costs Saul quite a lot. He's quite uncomfortable in the whole process of it. He's blind. And yet the result is amazing. Just what God can do. The effect that Saul has on hundreds of lives from this point onwards and on our lives today is incredible. One life transformed, what does it take? In this time when everything seems to be changing every day, it's not easy, it's not comfortable, and we're forced into our everyday homes, maybe no more big events and no more Sunday gatherings in person. But the risk is that we believe that there is no more transformative moments with God in this very moment. No one is too far out of God's reach. The story of Saul shows us that. Saul's transformation shows God's transformation power in anyone's life.